Welcome back to Lecture 9 on the Introduction to Psychopathy course. This lecture is entitled The Successful Psychopath. After this lecture, you'll be able to start to understand what traits and attributes might lead an individual to become a successful psychopath. You'll be able to evaluate the importance of clear definitions when discussing success and the concept of the successful psychopath. Before we begin this lecture, I'm going to ask you to take part in an activity. Here, I would like you to spend five to ten minutes considering the different professions or times in your life whereby being a psychopath might be advantageous or, at the very least, helpful. Try also to specify why these traits might be advantageous. Please pause the video here and start again when you are ready. Thank you for taking part in that task. I can very much imagine that from the outset, being asked to turn on its head a concept such as psychopathy, which to date we've been describing as antisocial or deviant in manner, and instead think about it as something which can be adaptive or even successful, is quite difficult. However, there are lots of professions, such as those on the screen right now, which are key and require individuals and have been shown to have individuals who take part in them, scoring high on measures of psychopathy. For example, if you are in the military, you are tasked with oftentimes ending the life of other individuals. This is not a pleasant task, and so being able to detach yourself and act in a cool, calm and calculated manner is key. You can't be hot-headed and act in a vengeful or impulsive way. Being a surgeon, you oftentimes have to take empathy out of the equation completely and behave in a manner whereby you can make these calculated decisions, ultimately preserving somebody's life, without anxiety or fear directing your decision-making. As a barrister or a lawyer, you might oftentimes be dealing with offenders or clients who have committed heinous crimes. However, it is your job to morally distinguish yourself from these individuals, act in an unempathic manner, and portray them as individuals who are not offenders. You may have to lie, you may have to deceive, and you may have to turn on its head the information that you've been given about that case in order to portray that individual in the lightest of lights. Throughout the rest of this lecture, we'll be talking about the concept of the successful psychopath and whether or not this is just an idealistic goal or whether it's something which can be accurately achieved. As we proceed, we'll start by returning to Dr. Hervey Cleckley one of the originators of the current concept of psychopathy and a name which has been discussed quite highly throughout all of the lectures in this series. Dr. Hervey Cleckley is quoted to say, at least some psychopathic individuals have seemingly achieved a reasonably successful adjustment to society. Moreover, certain psychopathic traits may counterintuitively prove to be evolutionary adaptive in certain situations. This is really interesting, as several of the traits that we have discussed, those 20 items throughout the PCLR, to date have been discussed in quite a detrimental and antisocial fashion. However, being good at parties, being able to get your arguments across to other people in the debate, being cool, calm and calculated, and not seeking revenge or acting overtly in an impulsive manner, can be key to gaining success if we can control these urges particularly. Being a likeable person may be advantageous in both society, interpersonal relationships and business, and being driven and cool and calculated can garner success in the fields of sport. I now introduce a 2006 book by Babiak and Hare entitled Snakes in Suits, When Psychopaths Go to Work. Throughout this book, Babiak and Hare systematically note some of the key concepts of psychopathy and how they map on to the profiles of high power businessmen and CEOs. In this book, they note a prevalence rate of 3.5% of psychopaths in the business world. Of note, this is greatly higher than those in the general population, but a lot lower than those in incarcerated forensic and clinical settings. Some of the key characteristics of high-powered business people include being able to be instinctive, manipulative, and controlling and dominant in social situations. Such individuals are able to easily get what they want from both themselves 
others and their co-workers. Such individuals are often motivated by financial gain and in the background have hidden covert offences. Oftentimes this relates to white collar crime and not those of outward antisocial behaviour. Moreover, such individuals show a high degree of risk taking behaviour, which going back to our documentary on the Wolf of Wall Street, notes that some individuals are often able to take risks in terms of financial gain. Ultimately, this risk taking behaviour may be detrimental to an individual, but can oftentimes pay off, resulting in great prowess and dominance. Finally, I leave us with a systematic review on successful psychopathy. A review by Wallace, Heim, Sumich and myself in 2020 examined a total of 180 research papers which reported to study successful psychopathy. However, there was an issue. Lots of times when the concept of successful psychopathy was discussed, this was purely discussed in terms of individuals who had not been imprisoned. And as such, yes, they scored high on psychopathy, but the only reason they were deemed to be successful was that they hadn't been caught yet not that they had actually garnered success in life, a key limitation of the research to date. However, after removing these papers and also removing the use of forensic populations and those without any direct measures of success, we finally had a total of 19 research papers which we assessed in a systematic review. Key factors which were associated with successful psychopathy were found to be individuals who were fearless, immune to stress, had high social potency and could work well in social situations. They had normal or superior cognitive performance, which reflecting on some of the biological underpinnings is quite surprising. Said individuals were oftentimes in leadership positions and also had a stronger aversion to punishment during conflict. Individuals would often act in a way which they would take risks regardless of the potential punishments and outcomes as a function of those. A nice infograph of this research is found in the following page. Here we see the systematic review modelled throughout the concept of psychopathy as defined by Cleckley in 1941. In the middle, yes, we do have these callous and emotional traits, which are a core component of any concept of psychopathy and ones which cannot be disregarded. However, intertwined with this, we have aspects of emotional intelligence, functional impulsivity, resilience, fearless dominance, and executive functioning. In terms of emotional intelligence, this allows for emotional stability when individuals are placed in stressful situations. They have perspective taking and cognitive empathy, which allows them to adapt in society, even though they may lack this affective empathy, which allows them to feel the way other people feel. We have functional impulsivity, which relates to an adaptive risk reward system, which allows for faster decisions due to an absence of fear or failure. Therefore, yes, they do show impulsivity, but this is highly functional and non maladaptive in nature. Resilience indicates that psychopaths are able to protect themselves against negative emotions, such as depression, anxiety and stress, and as such can take on large workloads without being detrimented by poor mental health. They also have protection from adverse effects, which could be beneficial in obtaining personal accomplishments and professional success. Fearless dominance and executive functioning, which are linked together. In terms of fearless dominance, it is linked to strong leadership and adaptive behaviour. Individuals are able to go out there and get what they like. And executive functioning, which is thought to be normative or even enhanced in successful psychopaths which allow them to better focus, organise and regulate themselves. Our final activity, activity 9.2. Now that you have come to the end of the course, I ask you to once again spend a couple of minutes repeating the task we set aside for activity one. Here you should write down a series of key words and thoughts relating to how you might define a psychopath and how you might describe their behaviours, thoughts and day-to-day -day actions and living conditions. Finally, I want you to compare these thoughts to those that you wrote down in activity one and consider how and indeed why your preconceptions of psychopathy might have changed. 
Thank you very much for your interest in and attendance in this course. During this course, you have learnt about some of the historical underpinnings of psychopathy, ways to measure psychopathy in forensic and non-forensic settings, the facets of psychopathy from real world and media examples. You've learnt about the biopsychosocial model of psychopathy and also the psychopathic traits which can be adaptive and beneficial. I've been Dr. Dean Fido and I sincerely hope you have enjoyed this course and will join us for more in the future.